China's distant water fleet is basically a number of vessels that fish outside of the Chinese waters or the waters under Chinese uh, jurisdiction. Where are they? They're in every country that they could be in. We actually uh, did a study in 2014 and we've identified that they were in most of the EEZs of nations with coastal areas, um, with the exception of Canada and the United States and some European countries. Absolutely. Um, I believe underreporting is a major issue, not only for the Chinese fleet, but for every single distant water fleet I know of, including the EU. So basically, research that we did uh, showed that China under or reports basically 10% of its catches, nearly 10% of its catches. But at the same time, the EU, for example, the EU fleet reports only 30% of the catches. So basically, this means that the vast majority of the catch remains unreported by whichever fleet. Yes, a perfect example I would say is one that happened in Ghana. So a vessel that is supposedly Ghanaian, uh, but investigations reveal that it was in fact owned and operated by a Chinese co a company um, that had its foot in Ghana. Um, and it has an authorization to fish in Ghana, a license, but it has infringed upon some gear regulations, zone regulations, and so it ended up being caught uh, by the Ghanaian enforcement. And since this vessel has been supposedly under uh, ownership in Ghana, they said that they could not pay the fine, which was, I believe, set at $1 million. This happened last year. So the vessel went out and didn't pay its fine and was given a license to fish again shortly after, uh, or was keep it, kept fishing. And this year, the same vessel was caught for the same offenses within the same waters and was also released after paying, I believe, a fine of twenty to $40,000. I'm not sure anymore, but it's basically really nothing. And this is a perfect example because it masks the real ownership. Masking the real ownership of the vessel makes the fines really low. So there are various types of effects. So when you have a distant water fishing fleet that targets the same fish stock than small scale fishing communities, you will have obviously a lot of competition and a conflict there. In terms of catch opportunities, the small scale fishing fleet sees their catch opportunities decline. This means declines in revenues, declines in income, declines in opportunity to process the fish. So we have less jobs, on the shore. Um, but there is also a sentiment of frustration as well. You know, when you see your livelihood taken away by some big boat, you know, in front of your eyes, it actually increases the likelihood of occurrence of conflicts. Um, and sometimes it drives extreme reactions. You know, we call that, then we call that piracy. Um, some other times it's protests, civil protests, but it really, it has a wide scope of impacts, both economic in terms of income, in terms of livelihoods, but also social, because it does really break the community cohesion. And there is another impact that we often fail to mention is that at a certain point, people have to react. You know, when you lose your livelihood um, and you, you have to survive, basically, what do you do if you have no alternative legal livelihoods uh, in front of you, you will likely engage in illicit activities. We did a research recently, a paper that we released this year, where we found that coastal fishermen, especially in Latin America, for example, would increasingly engage or increase uh, illicit drug trafficking or use their boats to such illicit activities. Other fishermen would engage in illegal fishing. You know, when you're in the community, you don't have you don't have catch opportunities, you will likely use, for example, illegal gear, you know, you will throw explosives in the water to catch fish more easily and to have access to that fish. And so it's another impact that we fail to often mention, but it's there. So the relationship between the governments is always there. I would say China and these countries, um, there have been decades long relationships, I would say, economic, diplomatic relationships. China has invested in um, in these places quite a lot, uh, I might say. And how it works is usually you have an underlying framework 
uh, that support such negotiations. For example, China is present through a project, let's say building a road, building a dam, building a hospital, providing some military equipment, um, building a fishing processing factory and things like that, a port. And within that framework, there are several deals that, that pass under that umbrella, one of which is you know, allowing the fleet to be operating in these countries. And this is not very uncommon. It's actually not uncommon at all. So you will see on the field, for example, you go to Mauritania and they will tell you this fishing shed, uh, which is very important to our coastal community, uh, has been built by the Chinese company, which had a deal with Mauritania for 25 years. And people see it, they can touch it. It's something that is tangible. So they said, you know, at least we could see this money, at least we could use it. I think that China has been already doing something that I really uh, like very much, which is uh, the, they have a uh, blacklist, their own blacklist of fishing vessels and companies. So um, they remove subsidies from vessels and companies who have been engaging illegally um, in the waters of other countries. However, it is not enough. It's far from being enough. They have, they have to address the opacity of the ownership. They have to address these massive illegal fishing practices a little more proactively. Um, it's not there yet. So um, they are building, I would say, building back a reputation. Um, it takes time. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, there, it's a massive fleet uh, that it's not necessarily easy to control. But they are, I think, undertaking some positive steps forward. There is a lot of engagement going on uh, between either global fishing watch and countries and between ourselves and countries and governments. Um, I believe that transparency is important, but moreover, information democracy is important much more than that, because if that's how you make sure that people benefit from that transparency, like, and the right people benefit from it. So um, there's a lot of engagement going on, obviously, for example, like in really simple processes is to communicate back any information that exists or that we have to the right people or the people that should be concerned about that information. Um, it's something that we do quite often. Um, there is uptake. It is, for example, we created spyglass.fish, which is a platform that publishes the criminal record of fishing vessels. And the idea is to make it simple so governments can just check the criminal record of fishing vessels and companies before they license them. It's only six months old, uh, seven months old now, but um, hopefully there is more uptake in the future.